Flexibility training. If you're studying for your NASM exam, probably not the most exciting chapter, but I can tell you that this stuff has a huge impact on client results, especially downstream. And if you want to make the most out of the OPT model, you really want to make sure you understand how to implement the different modalities. We're going to go through all four types of flexibility training NASM talks about, but what's important first is to introduce my model, my lovely wife in the video today, right? Lucky me, I call her the mobility queen, so it's perfect that she's in here today. She can impress us with her flexibility because mine's not that great. And if you guys haven't been on our videos before, my name is Coach Joe Drake. And what I wanna do is make sure that we first understand flexibility. Flexibility, if you guys look at the NASM textbook, extensibility of all tissues, both contractile and non-contractile. And that's, we just gotta keep in mind, whether we're doing any flexibility for the quads, or right now she's doing some foam rolling for the hamstrings, is we have the muscle, right, the contractile tissue, and then we have everything else, right? We have tendons, we have ligaments, we have our fascia, right, myofascial release. So there's a lot of things that are gonna impact our range of motion and that extensibility. The other thing I wanna make sure we understand is that when we're talking about flexibility, oftentimes we think about one muscle, right? Like a hamstring stretch, a calf stretch, a chest stretch. And there are gonna be some strategies to improve our range of motion in those areas, but there's a lot of muscles coming into that area, right? Even here as we're foam rolling the hamstrings or if we were doing some hamstring stretching, there's a lot of other muscles that come in and attach to that hip joint. And I'll take you back for a second. If you're like me, I might be dating myself. I don't know if they do the sit and reach test anymore, but if you were to do like the old school sit and reach test that we did in PE class, Right, everyone talked about, oh, this is like hamstring flexibility. Well, the hamstrings are one of many muscles, right? Literally from the base of our feet to the base of our skull, we are connected. And they all impact one another. So this is really, let's call it like a posterior chain flexibility test, or better yet, maybe mobility. And that's the word some of you guys might even be more familiar with. In the best of ways, mobility has become a lot more popular these days because the difference between mobility and flexibility is now we're looking at multiple muscles and the impact on the entire joint. So rather than saying, what is my hamstring flexibility? It's more like, what's the range of motion that my hip is giving me? And really the key to getting the most out of this beyond just the NASM textbook is finding strength, building strength in those deeper ranges of motion. But we're gonna stay focused. We're gonna go through all four different types of flexibility training. The first method of flexibility training, you're gonna find in all the phases of the OPT model, especially pre-training, although you could do it both, is gonna be self myofascial release or foam rolling. And if you guys aren't familiar with this, we do have some other videos that go through in depth an entire routine of foam rolling and dive into a little bit more how to uh, implement it. Definitely a great tool and strategy to put into your toolbox. But the idea behind this is that we have two potential impacts. And I say potential because there's still a scientific theory behind foam rolling. And even it's kind of controversial among some circles, but either way, great tool can have a big impact, positive impact on the client experience and get them in better positions. That's what we're looking for. First of those is the mechanical effect. Literally, right, by placing pressure on the muscles and even as Megan rolls back and forth right now, which she's being a really great model because I know how sensitive her quads and hip flexors really are, is that not only do we have blood flow, right, by creating that mechanical pressure that then blood has to kind of flow back in and create an impact getting rid of byproducts, but also that we're breaking up what we call like knots or hot spots, adhesions. Think of it as like literally we have little knots that are restricting our range of motion and the mechanical pressure helps to realign some of those tissues. So that's one theory behind it. The other one is the neurophysiological impact and that is the actual stimulation. This is where muscle spindles and Golgi tendon organs come back into play. That the actual pressure of the roller creates an impact to force those things to help our brain to relax. Meaning that literally the foam roller has an impact on our neurological system trying to you know, encourage our muscles to relax, maybe to send less signal to that area. Either way, the impact is hopefully more range of motion when we're done. And you guys can see too, Megan's going through a couple different strategies. Your simple approach, we're not gonna show you everything, is rolling with those muscle fibers first. If you find an area that's relatively sensitive, maybe hang out there for about 30 seconds. And if you wanna take it to the next level, maybe even flex and extend that knee to get even more out of it. Our second type of flexibility is the one you're probably most familiar with, old school static stretching, which unfortunately has kind of been demonized in today's fitness industry for research that came out saying, hey, if you static stretch before you work out, you're not gonna have any force output. And the reality is, is the research that was done is in much greater lengths of time, people holding like two to three minute stretches. And then there's the other reality, 
which is at least for me, most people I work with, are not looking for maximal force output. So just keep in mind, static stretching absolutely has a place, potentially before and after training, and it's gonna be really up to you as the coach to decide how to implement those things based upon where they're at and where their goals are. But we're gonna go into one, we're gonna keep that little theme going from our previous piece where we were foaming on the quads, and now I'm gonna have Megan set up what we call the couch stretch. So she's just gonna go one leg back up, right? This is one you can do comfortably at home. Other foot's gonna come in front, and then she's just gonna sit up nice and tall. So static stretch, just like it sounds, we're not moving, right? This is the simplest version. You know, there's not a lot of coaching usually that has to go into it, except for getting them in the right position. Now, one thing that's also talked about inside the flexibility chapter that especially comes to play in our static stretching is gonna be this lengthening reaction where all of a sudden, maybe after about 20 to 30 seconds, now again, she's the mobility queen. This is probably not a big no, stretch for her. No, good, so the quads are tight. So we got a good impact, right? And this is actually a good strategy, foam rolling right into the stretch. This is how you guys wanna do it. So after about 20 to 30 seconds, all of a sudden she might get a little bit more range of motion, right? Either A, she feels more comfortable, you know, shifting her body a little further forward, or even if you want more in the quad instead of the hip flexor shifting back. Either way, what happens is after about 20 seconds, your brain is like, oh, yeah, this is okay. Because initially when she first gets into this stretch, guess what fires up? Muscle spindles. <laughs> Telling your body like, oh, you're stretching. Like, let me tighten up a little bit. And then after a little while, all of a sudden her Golgi tendon organs are like, hey, we're sensing quite a bit of tension here. Let's relax the muscle spindle. So hopefully you can relate to that. Even in like hamstring stretches, other stuff, all of a sudden you get more range of motion. Well, your neurological system is relaxing. And there are a lot of really great examples, especially if you guys are studying for the NSM exam. Inside the textbook, static stretching definitely has its place. And for you as a coach, it's all about weighing the benefits of if I can get this person in a much greater range of motion and position over time, is that going to allow me to train with more intensity down the road? If so, then static stretching is a great strategy. Our next phase or stage of flexibility training is now moving into active and specifically what NASM calls active isolated stretching. And this is where it's pretty easy to differentiate static stretching and then the other two. But sometimes it can get kind of confusing like what's active isolated, what is a dynamic stretch? Now I'll tell you guys when you're out in the real world and you're training clients, you're probably gonna use all of them, right? So don't get stuck in the mindset like I'm only gonna use one phase you're probably going to need to, or you should use a mixture of them. But the big difference between active isolated, which we're gonna show you in our dynamic, is the dynamic starts to look more like exercises. And we're not thinking so much contract, relax techniques. Some of the examples that NASM gives you, which are great inside the textbook, are very much what I would call a contract, relax technique, where we're trying to take advantage of reciprocal inhibition, meaning we're gonna contract one muscle to help relax the opposite or increase tension throughout that other one. And you almost do it more in reps and sets, like two sets of five to 10. All right, so what I'll do is we're gonna keep that quad theme going for our quad queen here, as we found out she's pretty tight there today. And uh, rather than the static couch stretch, now we're gonna come down and we're gonna do a little bit more active, isolated hip flexor. You're still gonna get some quad based on where someone's tight. So the key, you guys can do this one at home as well, all right? First, you wanna dig your back toe in. And then from here, you wanna do, it's a very small move, but you wanna kinda of tuck the hips under, right? We call that your posterior tilt and squeeze that glute. And if you're like me right away, you're like, ooh, ooh, yeah, right? Our cameraman behind is doing it right now too. I can see him, which I love. And now, as you feel that, right? So there's that contract piece. That's gonna help shut down activity. Reciprocal inhibition, right? Connecting all this stuff together. And now Megan's gonna push through her back toe to drive forward, ooh, yeah, and then rock back. And she's just gonna take her time. We're gonna go through maybe five to 10 of these on each side. And if you have someone who's extremely restricted here, you may even come back and do multiple sets. So this is a really great example. First off, I hope you try this one at home because this is a great one of active isolated stretching. And if you wanna solidify the other ones, make sure you do go through some of the NASM material. Even if you aren't studying for the NASM exam, this style of mobility flexibility is really great to throw in pre-training session. Our fourth and final piece of the flexibility training strategies that the NASM textbook goes through is dynamic. And this really starts to look a lot more like exercises. And truthfully, for many clients, especially some of your intermediate to beginner clients, maybe those coming in deconditioned, this may end up being what their workout looks like as you're integrating those other flexibility techniques. So the idea, hey, you think about these different pieces, Myofascial release foam rolling has its place in all the different phases, but you kind of already know if someone already struggles with certain static stretches, 
then they're probably gonna struggle more with the other things down the chain, the active isolate and the dynamic. So you can kind of continue this almost like you would the OPT model, where this is gonna be the most demanding, challenging version of our flexibility and mobility. But for me, this is my goal to get all clients into. So we'll give uh, Megan a little example that kind of plays off of the same quads, hip flexors. It's gonna bring some other stuff in as well that we've been working on so far in this video. Hopefully she's feeling real juicy, although we've only done one side, so we'll see how that goes. And what Megan's gonna do, she's gonna take a nice reverse lunge back and she's gonna rotate over the top of that front knee and just take her time alternating legs. Yeah, it's fine. She doesn't take direction very well, but that's a whole different conversation. And uh, as you can see, again, this is very much an exercise, but here the goal is not loading the exercise, right? Obviously over time, this could be a great warm up move for some loaded reverse lunges and a workout that we're doing, but it's using, and you guys will see this in the textbook, using the body's momentum to take the joints through a greater range of motion. Even here with that little twist, we're getting a little transverse plane to place a little bit more tension and load on the quads and the hip flexors. Flexibility training, one of the areas that I find trainers come in the least confident in and understanding how to implement it. Are my clients gonna wanna do this stuff? Is it too slow? Does it take too much time? I promise you this stuff will go a long way, not just towards allowing your clients to train harder in the gym, but honestly providing a lot of value inside your training sessions. People love getting results, they love changing their body, but they also love doing it when they feel good. So make sure you guys really understand this stuff and you start to use it. And if you want a little bit better idea on how to use it, because that may be a missing element as you're going through some of the NASM textbook and terminology, check out the link in the description below. We've created a video on what we call prep and prime, and it really is just an easier way to think about how you integrate some of these things in to the beginning of your training sessions, not only to create a great experience for your clients, but to allow them to train harder and move better as you continue to grow and go on. So if you guys are studying for your exam, I wish you guys the best of luck, and I can't wait to see you inside of our next video.